What's going on everyone, 2AM here, and I just completed this character model recently, so I want to share a few tips I used for creating anime style characters like this one. Now this will kind of be a full process, but not really, because I want to focus more on specific techniques. So use whichever ones you think are helpful. So tip number one is when to use sculpt mode versus edit mode. Now a good Blender user will always be able to use both, but I've noticed a lot of professional users tend to do it like this. So for the torso and the limbs, they use sculpt mode first. Now obviously when you use sculpt mode, you're left with all these vertices, which is not good for exporting to VTuber models or game characters. So after they use sculpt mode, they do what's called retopology where they go into edit mode and using the snapping tools, they create a more simple, lower poly version of the mesh. Now, why do they go through this whole process and not just skip the sculpting step? I'll explain that later. But as for the hands and feet, they tend to use edit mode to manually model the hands and feet and then use sculpt mode to refine the hands and the feet. So that's the process I copied when I made this model. So starting from scratch, the first thing I did was model the hands and feet. From my point of view, it's easier to manually model the hands and the feet instead of using sculpt mode. And here's a couple reasons why. First of all, there's a lot of tiny details in the hands and the feet, including the fingers, the fingernails. And these parts are actually kind of a pain to sculpt, but in edit mode, it's much easier and simpler. Now, after this video, I do plan on making tutorials on how I make my hands and feet using a very simple method. So stay tuned for that if you're interested. But as you can see, another advantage of manually modeling the hands and feet is that you can simply copy the toes and the fingers. Now I tend to do the big toe separate from the other little toes and the thumb separate from the other fingers because the thumb and the big toe do look a lot different than the other ones. Of course, another advantage of manually modeling the hands and feet is that you can make them clean, simple, and functional. And when your mesh is clean like this, it's very easy to go into sculpt mode and then just inflate the parts that need inflating because the topology is very well suited to the shape of the foot. Now, one other thing you'll notice when I upload my full process for hands and feet is that it's a very specific and consistent method. And I did like that on purpose because every time I make a new hand or foot, I don't want to guess or make a new way every time. I just want to follow the steps that I made. And when you repeat processes like this, that's how you get faster and that's how you improve faster. Another advantage of doing this is you will have the same number of vertices in the openings of your hands and feet every time. So modeling these parts like this and having the openings at the wrists and ankles be at a low amount of vertices is a good advantage and it's thinking ahead because they're obviously going to be connected to the arms and the legs and those parts are usually simple and don't have too many vertices. So I usually just like to keep track. My hands have 12 vertices at the openings and my feet have 10. For the next tip, I want to explain what Dine Topa and Remesh are for those that don't know them yet. They sound complicated, but they're just very simple and useful tools in sculpt mode. So when first creating the sculpted body, we block it out using simple shapes like spheres and cylinders as you can see here. And they're all just joined into one object with Control J, but as you can see, like they're overlapping each other. And there's like vertices inside, but if we go to sculpt mode and go to remesh, you can see that we can join all of these, give us new vertices to work with, and it also deletes all the vertices that are inside. Now we can turn on die and topo, set detailing to constant detail and resolution to about 40 turn on the mirroring in our brush, and we'll be good to go to sculpt this into something that actually looks like a body. We can use the smooth tool to smooth out the edges from the shapes. And all Dine Topo means is uh, whenever you sculpt, you're creating new vertices. So without Dine Topo, you're really only moving vertices that you already have. You don't want that because it's not flexible. One good thing about sculpting first is that we can carve out these really uh, fine details like the collarbone, also the rib cage. And when we sculpt out these parts like this, uh, as I'll show you later, it's much easier to create the topology right over it. So in this next tip, I'll show you how to take this thing with like a billion vertices and make it very much simpler. To set this up, we have to create a new plane object. Find this viewport display option and make sure in front is checked. Turn on snapping, which is the magnet icon you see there, and make sure to also select face nearest. This is Blender version 3.3, by the way. It might look different if you're using a different version. But as you can see there, we have our plane object, and whatever you do with this plane object, it will snap to the sculpted body that we made. And because we turned on the in front, we can always see it on top, and that will make it easier for us to work with it. Now, I won't go over every single part, but 
here's how it works with the chest area. We just go around it, extruding new vertices, press E to make new points, and then press MA to merge them at those two points. And I select all the vertices around it, use E to extrude and S to scale it down, and as you can see, it just follows the shape of the sculpted body we just made. Obviously we have to adjust this because it looks a little messy right now, but hopefully you get the point. Shade smooth and look at that. Now it's a very similar process for the leg. At the bottom of it, I just make sure it's matching with the foot, which is 10 vertices. Extrude it upwards, use Control R to subdivide. And once you move those subdivided points, it follows the shape of the sculpted legs. So as promised, I'll explain more why I like this method of sculpting first, then doing retopology instead of just modeling from the start, because I have done that before. I have purely modeled without sculpting the body, but I think when you sculpt the body first, you can get the curves more accurate to the proper anatomy. And as mentioned, you can easily sculpt the collarbone, the rib cage, even the abs and stuff. But I actually won't model the abs here. It's kind of overkill, but I will do the other stuff. So as you can see, for those parts like the rib cage, we just add extra vertices there and make sure they follow the curve of the object that we modeled. And it's not hard because again, it just snaps onto what we already made. And here I'm just following the basic rules of topology, which we just follow the shapes of the body, the contours of the body, and we try to make sure everything is a quad, which is it has four edges. Well, for the most part, there's there's at least two faces here that have more than four uh, edges, but you know, that's for good reason. And here is me connecting the hands and the feet. Again, this is simple because we keep track of our wrist and ankle vertices. So the wrist has 12. We match that with the arm and make it 12 vertices as well. So when we join this object and bridge edge loops, they both have the same number of faces. So it just connects perfectly. And here's more of a general art tip. If you ever get the feeling that something is off or wrong about your work, don't ignore it. Always try to adjust it. You always have to be constantly looking for the imperfections in your work and assessing it looking at it objectively and that's the key to fast improvement so here the arms are too long but fortunately that's a quick fix now we get onto the face and the head and my preference for this one is to not sculpt it but rather just use edit mode from the rip and this is because of the small details like the eyes and nose and mouth which have to be very specific so that's why i prefer using edit mode for the precision now i notice a lot of people who create anime models will trace over their reference images which is they'll import the image of the head as a plane and trace the vertices over it now i'm not necessarily against this you saw my oldest video i drew my own 2d reference image and then traced over it so i do use both methods but my tip for fast improvement is to learn to model without tracing too i did have a reference image for this character but I decided not to trace it, but instead put it off to the side and attempt to recreate it with just uh, freehand modeling. So I won't get too detailed on this section, but basically I just create the side edges and the front edges of the face, including the mouth and the nose. And if you notice on the eye sockets and even the mouth, they're angled a little. They're not fully straight onwards. Otherwise the face will look very flat. And then after you've uh, made the boundaries of the face, that's when you use your edit mode skills and try to fill in this mask of the face as best as you can. And unfortunately, unlike the hands and the feet, we don't have a true formula for this one. So we can't just do the same thing every time because you know faces look different all the time. But hopefully in the future, I'll also have a full detailed video on how I model faces. Also do note that this will be an unlit model. So I don't really have to care about uh, how the normals will be on this face or how the shadows will hit it because there won't be any shadows on it. It would actually look completely different if I had to care about how the shadows are hitting the face. But anyways, filling in the face like that is kind of just like a puzzle. You just have to get in there and figure it out uh, with a lot of trial and error. The face is very skinny right now. There's not a lot of meat on her cheeks, but we'll fix that in sculpt with a little inflate tool. And before I would just finish off the rest of the head using uh, modeling as well, but to make it more efficient, I just used the snapping method again, created a new sphere object, uh, sculpted it to fit the gaps of the head, and then I just used snapping to easily finish off the rest of these vertices. The neck is another connection point you'll have to be wary of, so when I'm making the bottom of the head, I'm making sure it's the same uh, number of vertices as the opening on my body and neck area. 
Now, truth be told, the number of vertices on this face and head is kind of high. I wish I made it a little simpler than that, but uh, it's no big deal. My next tip is to mark your seams uh, because this makes it very easy to unwrap and texture. You'll find this simply in Edge Menu Mark Seam. So all these red lines, you can just copy where I put them, which is around the edges of the hand, on the face where it separates from the rest of the head, on the base of the neck, on the base of the ankles, and one going down the middle of the leg. As you can see, the one that cuts the hand in half also extends to the elbow and to the back of the shoulder blade area. And I should mention I also put seams around each of the fingernails. And by doing this, I've cleanly separated each part of the body for texturing, except for the feet. The feet uh, are kind of bad, but that's okay because she's gonna be wearing shoes anyway. If you see the feet, there's like a bunch of vertices bunch up into one, and that's what you're trying to avoid when you um, create these seams. If you look at the other islands, they have a they have very spaced out faces. Now here's a little cheat for unlit models. You don't actually have to create eyeballs. You just have to shade the back of the eye socket to make it look like it's the eyeball, which is what I'm doing here. This won't work for every situation and application, but for the ones it does, you save yourself the process of having to create an eyeball. And that's also going to make it easier for you when you create expressions and shape keys for your character if you're doing that because you don't have to worry about moving the eyeball either. All right, so we're almost all out of tips. Before I give you the last one, let me just ask what you think of this video idea. Originally, it was supposed to just be a full time lapse without commentary, but instead I decided to make it parts of a time lapse so that I can highlight specific techniques and tricks used in the process. So do you think you would learn better from videos like this or, or a full time lapse with no commentary? If people like this video style, then I might make a series where uh, it's going to be the usual character creation process, but each time I'll highlight different techniques that I use or try. As always, feel free to leave your feedback or questions in the comments below. Now, the last tip that I have for you today, number 10, is the method that I use for the hair this time. Now, there's many different ways to do hair, and actually for me, it was the most complicated and daunting part of the entire process because it's actually pretty time consuming and complicated. But to achieve good hair actually takes a lot of work. So here I'm using the curves method plus a snapping mask plus seams. So for those that don't know, it's pretty easy to set this up. Just create a circle curve and a path curve. For the circle curve, you make it the shape of a hair strand. Now there's a very important step I don't want you to miss for either of these objects. Go to a resolution preview and turn it down to one or zero. Otherwise, when you convert it to a mesh, it's gonna have like a million vertices. Now in the green tab for the path curve under geometry, click object, and then use the eyedropper tool to click on the circle curve. And this is now your hair strand object, which you can duplicate as many times as you want. And let me just go over some basic controls here when you go into edit mode. Curve object is just much easier to control and we can use Alt S to shrink or fat in certain vertices. The usual shortcut, just S, won't work. You have to use Alt S, and then to rotate them, you actually have to use Control T. And guess what? We're gonna create yet another snapping mask. So for this one, I want to try to find the viewport properties so that I can change it in display as wire, so that I can see through it. And you can even turn down the opacity of this wire. And you want the snapping guide to be bigger than that, even bigger than I made here. I actually had to enlarge the hair scale it up later because because if the snapping mask is too small it will the hair will look very flat here's a curved hair strand technique that i just showed you you always want to make sure that the start of the hair strand is at the center of the head and for the first hair strand if you make the origin of the object at the center of the top of the head when you duplicate it you can easily rotate it and will just rotate along the top of the head perfectly and you definitely want that because that's just proper technique so as this goes on, you can see the hair is looking okay, but it, as I said, it's looking kind of flat because the mask is too small. So that's why I'm saying if you're trying this, make the mask a little bit bigger than I made it. And of course, turn on and off the snapping mode as you desire, because obviously some parts of the hair are not going to conform perfectly to the shape of the mask. Now, texturing the hair is really tedious, but if you want full control over the texture of your hair, then this is how, well, this is one method on how to do it. 
After converting each hair into a mesh object, I go into edit mode and uh, mark a seam along every hair strand where it separates from the front of the hair to the back of the hair. And now when I separate it into this texture, I can easily put the back of the hair where it belongs so that uh, it will have that shadowed look. Even in just this two-tone texture right here before I start painting. As you can see, I had to do this for every hair strand and it is a long process, but we can do it guys, come on. After all is said and done, we can now move on to an easier part, which is just painting. And they actually have a new feature uh, in the more recent versions of Blender, I think 3.3 and up, where you can press Alt-Q and you can switch directly between layers while you're in sculpt mode. So I'm just doing that uh, so that I don't have to tab out of sculpt mode every time I want to select a different hair strand. Uh, I might as well include this bonus tip because it's already here. Uh, if you ever have any skin tight clothing, just duplicate the parts of your body mesh where it's over, separate them by selection, and then go into sculpt mode and inflate them. And you should go into the proper viewport when you're doing this so that you can see when, uh, when the skin tight clothing is actually uh, wide enough to be directly over the body mesh because you don't want them to be like stacked on top of each other. But yeah, that's really gonna be it for this video. So if you enjoyed or if it helped you, please leave a like and consider subbing. I'm gonna leave in some more parts of the time lapse that you might find interesting, but I won't commentate over them anymore. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.